Good afternoon. This is Alyssa Lenhoff Briggs, and I am the director of the STEM Learning Ecosystem Community of Practice and on the call today with uh, Veronica Gonzalez, the Deputy Director of the STEM Learning Ecosystem Community of Practice. Um, and we are thrilled that you joined us today for what is the last um, webinar in a series um, that we've been doing this quarter. Um, and today's topic is uh, dealing with something that I think nearly every single ecosystem um, told us was an issue of you know concern or great interest for them fundraising so welcome i'm thrilled to have you here um, this afternoon and before we begin let's uh make sure that you know about the internal website and where you can find some resources that are both related to today's webinar the earlier webinars that we've done and other um where to find other resources. It's the resources tab of the library page on the internal website. And there's all sorts of really great documents and resources in there. And I also wanted to urge you to share some information that you have that you think may be useful to others with us and we will park it up there. Um, this is a living, growing, breathing library of resources and we're very eager to continue building it and um, leveraging your great work to help other ecosystems. Um, if you've joined one of our early, earlier webinars uh, of this quarterly series, then you already know um, why we are doing these webinars like this, but there are, I think, perhaps a few people who have not joined an earlier webinar. So I'll take a, just a really quick minute or two to explain um, the thinking behind this series of webinars. Um, we asked every single ecosystem leader to identify their ecosystem strengths as well as their ecosystem's needs. So we then, Veronica and I, spent a good deal of time looking at, talking about, analyzing that information that you shared with us and came up with this grouping of webinars that, that we've had over the last uh, little over a week now. Uh, today is, again, the last one of that series. And what we did is we asked panelists who have identified, self-identified as particularly strong in an area of great desire for you know, continuing um, enrichment, we've asked panelists um, who say they're experts in that area to join us um, to help lead these webinars. So speaking of those experts, let me, um, uh, if we want to advance to another screen, um, talking about fundraising models today with us and sharing a little bit about the work of their ecosystems. I'm going to ask uh, my colleague and friend, Veronica, to introduce today's panelists. Sure, thank you so much, Alyssa. Um, and as Alyssa mentioned, this is the last of a series of webinars that we have done together. Um, this is definitely meant to be a discussion. So as we chat, we highly encourage you to ask questions, to share your stories with us as well. Um, you know, we'd love to hear from all of you on the line. Um, before we get started to kind of review the different types of fundraising models, we do want to introduce the panel. So uh, if I can have our panelists introduce themselves and their ecosystem very quickly, perhaps we start with Allison, then move to Jeannie, and then Heather. Uh, sure, your yeah. Name, your uh, organization, my... ecosystem, perfect. Perfect. Uh, my name is Allison Brody. I'm uh, here in New Mexico with the STEM and M uh, ecosystem, uh, the New Mexico STEM uh, learning ecosystem. And I work at Explora, which is a science center and children's museum in Albuquerque. And we are the backbone organization for the ecosystem. Okay, my name's Jeannie Miller. I am the co-lead along with Dr. Brian Gasper, superintendent of Jim Thorpe School District for the Carbon Schuylkill Zern STEM ecosystem, uh, which is composed of three mostly rural counties in Northeast Pennsylvania, Carbon Schuylkill Zern, and we cover about 800 square miles. 
Well, hi, this is Heather Kleiner. I am uh, the founder and director of the North Louisiana STEM Alliance. And I work at Cyport Discovery Center, which is a 96,000 square foot science center museum, children's museum on the Red River Riverfront, downtown Shreveport in Louisiana. And we, um, we cover the Northwest region of Louisiana. And Cyport is the backbone organization. Great. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. Um, and again, I just mentioned in the chat box, this is meant to be a discussion. So we would love to hear from all of you and your fundraising journey as ecosystem leaders as we continue the conversation. Um, before we get into the discussion and talk through a couple of the different types of um, fundraising, you know, journeys that each of these ecosystems have gone on and their successes and even the learning from some of the failures. I think we want to just highlight a few different fundraising models that we've seen throughout the ecosystem community of practice. Um, Alyssa mentioned that resource library and these fundraising models, in addition to some examples and links, to the ecosystems that have leveraged them um, that exists as sort of a, a word document that you can download freely and take a look at at any time um, but this is just sort of a high level review of those um, so stem learning ecosystems just like many you know organizations in general uh, have generated funding to sustain their efforts in a variety of different ways i would say that most ecosystems are using a combination of these types of fundraising um, models, uh, no one ecosystem is surviving off of one model alone. Typically, there's, you, you know, you have certain percentages where you're getting funding from each different type or at least a few of them. Um, so we just wanted to briefly highlight those to get all of you, especially on the line as well, thinking about how you're leveraging these yourself. Um, and then also to maybe new things that have come up for you that you never even considered. Um, so again, this is listed on the resource library and there's examples that are built out in there as well that we hope to find, that we hope you find useful. Um, so the first is obviously grant funding. Uh, you know, a lot of us apply for state, federal, corporate, philanthropic grants to support typically specific initiatives, um, programs, and sometimes even general operation costs, which might include staffing or you know, overhead um, materials, things of that sort. Uh, you typically would respond to a request for proposals, you send in a, a RFP there, and then we'll get approval on whether or not you get a certain amount of dollars to support what you've applied for. Um, another model is boards and using boards as fundraising mechanisms. Um, Several ecosystems have developed some type of a board that functions very similarly to the way that a board of a nonprofit organization might work. Um, they might have give guests as part of the responsibility and role as a board member where folks in the community are expected to contribute to the ecosystem to support and lead the work. Um, they also too might get other contributions from their own network to support the ecosystem's work. Um, next, STEM champions, so this might be very similar to the way that a board member might, um, you know, have folks, individuals or corporations donate on behalf of the ecosystem. It just might be slightly less formal. So a STEM champion um, might do the work outside of sort of an existing quote unquote board. Um, champions also typically have pretty big recognizable names um, and good networks within communities and can go around and, and really rally for the support of some funding or in-kind resources for their ecosystem. Um, the next model is a pay-to-play type of model. Uh, I know that a few ecosystems use this, not very many yet, although I've heard many ecosystems talk about playing with the idea of implementing a type of pay-to-play -play or membership fee um, to be a part of the ecosystem. Um, another type of model is in-kind donations. So I would say a very significant number of ecosystems leverage this as a type of fundraising, um, both 
internally and externally. A lot of ecosystems have received in-kind donations for space, for food contributions, resources, et cetera, to support the work of their ecosystem. Individual giving, um, I've seen and have signed up for several ecosystem newsletters and get solicitations for folks to be able to donate to the ecosystem and the regional work uh, in different ways. And that can, it is obviously for individuals and encourages that. Um, a fee for service type of model. So some ecosystems have been able to offer um, services. So for example, I know a few ecosystems that are doing, uh, you know, professional development, for example, or running programs and charge a fee, and that that those fees go back into supporting the regional work of the ecosystem. Social enterprise being able to sell products. Um, that help generate funds for the ecosystem. Um, and then finally, and this is probably not an exhaustive list, but a pass-through support. So ecosystems sometimes will serve as conveners um, or grant-making uh, organizations that will re-grant um, to, to the community um, funds that are given to them from you know, corporations or philanthropic entities. Um, and as being a part of that fiscal agent or backbone organization, they receive a small um, portion of the grant or percentage to help with sort of the overhead uh, associated with, with managing what that process looks like. So again, this is by no means exhaustive, I'm sure. We'd love to hear from you in different um, models that you're using as well. We can add to this list together. Um, but we just wanted to highlight those as some um, models that ecosystems are using as we move into our discussion. Um, so perhaps we move to the discussion now. Um, I already see that we're getting questions in, which is amazing. Maybe we'll ask our first question and then we'll allow our audience to, to start engaging with us. Um, but Maybe we go in reverse order. So Heather, Jeannie, and then Allison, if you could just briefly tell us about how funding is secured for your ecosystem and, and what that funding is typically used for. Okay, so this is Heather. And um, funding for our ecosystem in a breakdown, it's mainly grants and in-kind support. And that's because I'm a grant writer. <laughs> and uh, so, I would say that from uh, private funding, we get about 52,000. We've gotten 52,000 since August of last year, uh, with 13,000 of that being overhead. And from state government, 64,000. So um, in kind, probably at least 10,000. Oh, okay, this is Jeannie Miller um, from CSL. Uh, we're sort of a hybrid also, and we were in the second cohort. So um, it's been very interesting. We've uh, utilized grants, uh, the 21st Century Community Learning Center grants uh, for our after-school program, which really has been um, the catalyst for our ecosystem. Uh, I, I, I let talk to people about utilizing sources like United Ways or foundations uh, in the state of Pennsylvania. We have something called EITC tax credits, which have helped fund our, some of our programs in our ecosystem. Uh, to the north, one of our programs used LSA gambling funds, which is very creative. Um, we've used work funding from our workforce development boards uh, from labor and industry. And most recently, grants came out from Pennsylvania Department of Education called PA Smart Grants where intermediate units who are very important in our ecosystem um, wrote computer science grants for our school districts. We also fund makerspaces through a private, public private partnership where the Shine After School program helps utilize funds from EITC to put makerspaces in schools. So during the day, it's used for the regular school by teachers and after school, uh, of course, for the after school program. Um, use in-kind in donations, of course, are extremely important. And I can provide information on how much these funding sources are if, if you need in the future. Um, we use in-kind donations for development of websites, grant writing, uh, development of our toolkit, community resource list, our professional development plan, uh, and, and looking into, and we're developing a high school pre-apprenticeship, and that's all through in-kind um, work. We have lots of champions in our, on our board, in our partners, 
And most recently, we're very excited. We actually have investors putting in a little pot of money in, and that pot's going to equal um, so many hours a week for a actual coordinator of every ecosystem. Um, we're going to leverage that with teacher in the workplace, teacher in the workforce grants. So we'll have someone in a position 10 hours a week who can even expand our comprehensive sustainability plan and um, include other uh, strategies. Nice. Uh, and this is Allison uh, from a new, uh, STEM and M. And um, ours as well is a, is a combination of approaches. And um, I guess I want to start out just by saying that um, uh, what we were doing over the last couple of years is is uh, going to have to change and evolve uh, to respond to, to on the ground situations uh, that are happening now. So um, what we have been doing is um, is uh, is in process of of of, uh, of an evolution here. Um, our major uh, approach has been uh, grant funding and sort of social enterprise. Um, the uh, when as we emerged as an ecosystem, our, our ecosystem partners collaborated to develop and write an, an NSF includes uh, proposal um, around our main uh, the main focus area of our ecosystem, which was the math achievement gap. And so we got that NSF includes grant, which was awesome, and we've been doing that, um, which really helped us. Um, you know, create that 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 collective impact and in, in, in collective measurement um, that's so elusive on that ecosystem level. Um, on the other hand, we're now in a no cost extension phase of that, so that you know that that phase of the ecosystem is is uh, is 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 changing. Um, we also developed a community wide program, uh, 12 months of math. Um, and each month um, was a different um, a theme of math, like the math of aerospace, uh, the, the math of, uh, of, um, of, uh, of uh, sound engineering. Uh, and we actually had uh, uh, our ecosystem partners um, uh, uh, basically supplied funding uh, for the month that that um, aligned with their um, with their company or their organization. Uh, so in terms of sponsorships, that was uh, at first a really clever way to to secure sponsorships. That is to provide programming um, uh, aligned with the sponsors, um, uh, you know, area of of, of expertise. Um, uh, and then for a time, we had funding secured through a partnership agreement with the Air Force Research Lab here in New Mexico. Uh, and that agreement was for the purpose of, of managing our ecosystem. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, we have already a question from the audience from Elena Farden. So I'm going to unmute you, Elena, if that's okay and would love for you to introduce yourself, your ecosystem, and then talk a little bit more about your, your question. Sure, so aloha, this is Elena Farden. I'm the lead for the Hawaii Loa Ecosystem Cabinet here in Hawaii. We're still very uh, a new ecosystem. So the question, and thank you everyone for, on the panelists for sharing um, your, your insights on the funding. So our question that we're trying to explore, because we're still new at, at this, is wondering beyond the funding models that has been shared, has there been an ecosystem that has explored impact investing, such as program-related investments? But that I think will open up to any of the panelists. I'm not sure if any of you have an idea of that, and I would also open that up to the rest of the audience. Elena, do you maybe want to expl explain just a little bit about program-related investments a little further, just in case? Sure, and I, oh, I hope yeah. I uh, uh -huh. explained this correctly, but we're looking at it as impact investing. So how do foundations who have a need to move the needle, say, for example, in um, school achievement or student persistence and graduation, provide, rather than a grant, more, more or less an investment in an effort to say in a STEM ecosystem because we're moving and we're doing programming and we're providing wraparound services. So rather than a grant, it's more of a, a partnership that we're investing in your program because you're helping us as a foundation move the needle in a specific um, area within the community that we see that we deem a, a critical in order for, for the foundation to support its mission. 
Okay, this is Heather. I understand your question. And um, so far, the North Louisiana STEM Alliance has not exactly done that. But one of our members, one of our partners, who's a member of our uh, STEM ecosystem, is called Step Forward. And you can look them up, Step Forward. I think it's stepforwardnla.org. But if you look up Step Forward in Louisiana or North Louisiana, you'll find them. I believe that that's pretty much kind of what they do. Um, they definitely look at metrics and moving the needle. They're very big on data. They follow the STRIVE model. And um, I know that they get um, funding from community supporters that I couldn't really, can you know, I couldn't really include it as part of the North Louisiana STEM Alliance because they have five different mission, you know, within their mission. And one of them is STEM education, you know, and so it could be, you know, early childhood literacy or um, at risk use or, you know, other topics. But but they would be a good organization to look up. And if you like, I can put you in touch with their executive director. That would be great. Thanks, Heather. Mm -hmm. And I'm Elena, actually going to was... unmute. Oh, sorry. Oh. I think there's some clarifying questions, Alyssa, if it's. I'm sorry, Veronica, do you have somebody I, I that wants to respond? Maybe respond or ask some clarifying questions. So Debbie, can you introduce, I unmuted you, if you could introduce yourself in the ecosystem that you're associated with and feel free to engage with Elena and some of the panelists around the clarifying questions you're asking. Oh, sure. So um, I'm Debbie Fitzenmime with Youth Coach. I'm part of the Alamo STEM ecosystem in San Antonio, Texas. I, I guess my question is, so, so this term impact investing, I, I think I'm trying to figure out if um, you are talking about, because impact investing is a combination of social plus financial return, so by the investor. So I'm trying to figure out, do you mean social investing in terms of that classic definition? Are you talking about social investing in terms of strictly investing for what I would call like a philanthropic, a social impact return, the change, um, uh, the change in behavior with no financial return? Yeah, I, I think maybe more of the latter, but we're still exploring. So this is a, an area that's new for us. So one of the things that we've been kind of diving deeper in is the program related investments. So I'm not sure if that's either the, the former or the latter that you explained, but I think the latter one sounds much more attractive to us. So I'm not sure if maybe I'm, I'm not explaining it correctly as well. Well, I only say that because I was looking up impact investing the other day. And so, so I'm sort of shifting to the term impact philanthropy, but I'm not sure if that's the right term either. But I think that unless there's a financial return, it technically doesn't fall under impact investment. Um, but I can tell you that there are some, I have heard of some organizations that do specifically impact investment. I don't know of an ecosystem that's using them yet. I know we're not. Um, but with the idea that that they will, in essence, and I, I wish I could remember the name of the organization that talked to us, but this is what they do. They make, they make an investment in a nonprofit. Um, they expect a dollar for dollar return on their investment, right? So you would have to have some kind of a product that's generating some kind of a revenue that meets their loan or their investment. They don't ask for a return on the investment. They don't ask for like additional money to come in. They don't take a percentage of income. They just want to know that that dollar for dollar is going to be met. It's an interesting model. I don't know how much chops it's gotten here. Thank you for that. I can, um, this is Alyssa, and I've got a follow-up question, but I can first offer um, a little bit more explanation. And Debbie, thank you for, for what you added to that. I think that that was helpful, and that Elena has opened a pretty interesting area for us, and perhaps a whole other topic that we may want to do some follow-up um, with. But essentially, impact investing, and there's all sorts of different kinds of it. Um, it can be um, where an organization is expecting some type of measurable gain. Um, it can be a social impact, an environmental impact, um, uh, a financial impact, 
some type of measurable gain and, and you work with, you know, the, the foundation or the organization to define, you know, at the outset, you know, what it is that you're going to deliver. It's really, you know, um, some foundations have begun doing it like with actual um, where they want a cash return. Um, other organizations are treating the currency at, you know, in, in different ways, but it's all about, you know, some type of measurable um, impact and return. So it's a new term for a, what is primarily um, kind of a very common way of, of giving funding. Does that help at all? It does. Thank you very much. Sure. And happy to, to keep, you know, talking about this um, um, and working with it. But I'm wondering, you know, and this does kind of, serve as a good segue for us. Um, I'm wondering if our panelists can share kind of quickly about what type of funding they do you have right now. Um, what mix is, is philanthropy? What is um, fee for service, et cetera? Um, Allison, how about if you start us off, then Heather, then Jeannie? Well, that's a super interesting question for us right now because we're kind of in transition. Um, so we're, um, you know, we're phasing out of our of our includes grant. Um, our um, a lot of our ecosystem partners are sort of uh, waning on the whole idea of math achievement as the um, the focus for our ecosystem. Uh, you know, uh, uh, um, workforce uh, development in uh, computer science are, are two topic areas that are kind of on the rise. So um, that 12 months of math program that we had that was so successful at securing sponsorships uh, for the first couple of years is now um, also in transition. We're, we're having to we sort of evolve that Allison. program. What's that? Alyssa, who was... I'm sorry. Should I go on? Can you all hear me? Allison, I, I hear you. Please okay. continue. I don't know what that okay, was. Sorry. Um, what what was? Okay, anyways, anyways, I'll go on. Um, and then um, uh, our uh, our partnership agreement with the Air Force Research Lab is also going to have to evolve. Um, uh, so we're not, we're no longer be able to rely on them uh, for helping us manage the ecosystem. Um, so yeah, for us, um, we are uh, currently, um, uh, back to the drawing board in terms of uh, writing grants, um, uh, looking for new partnerships and new programs, and um, uh, just sort of seeing what's next for us as an ecosystem. Excellent, thank you. And Heather? Okay, this, uh, this is Heather. When it comes to fee-for-service, that's a, that's an interesting question. What I would say is that individual ecosystem members have fee for service, probably you know LLCs or 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 um, even nonprofits. Like Demetrius Norman has his Northwest Louisiana Makerspace, and you pay to be a member to get access to the Makerspace. Um, Ebony Mitchell has. Um, a fee-for-service uh, LLC for the family who codes together and because they're you know involved in ecosystem business and it involves multiple partners their numbers count towards our metrics so I can say okay we have served collectively you know um, whatever it is up to date 18,000 individuals for 30,000 contact hours you know that counts um, so mostly, you know, when I described at the beginning, those are the things that SciPort as the backbone organization has tried to provide on behalf of our ecosystem. And really, these are philanthropic grants, but we do service activities. You know, we, we perform projects and, and we're endeared to our funders to get this done. 
One of them, um, the state government is Act 2 hotel motel tax for um, admissions, IMAX movie, and outreach. So it's a reimbursable grant. We have to perform the work to get the money back. So I guess you could kind of consider that a fee for service, but not in the way that, uh, you know, a small business would do it. Thank you so much, Heather. And Jeannie? Sure. Um, looking at our funding you know, since cohort two, since 2016, um, of course, we're a little bit heavier on the grants and we're rural. So we don't have large organizations or, or um, uh, we just don't have large STEM institutions. Our institutions are our school districts, our current technical schools, our community colleges. So we have to be really creative. But um, our after school program has really been the heart and the catalyst for the ecosystem and I, this year we received we're going to receive almost seven million dollars over the next five years for after school focusing on stem uh, there's going to be 23 stems that that funding um that after school program is like, like i said really important to us and, and it's, i'll tell you for those who are anyone rural when we started these programs out uh, with the ecosystem never knowing when we started shine way back in 2004 that, that would be our infrastructure for our stem ecosystem so that 21st century funding is big time for our rural area um, and our focus on stem and it, it's interesting uh we don't have fee for service but uh, but the conversation has talked about the data and um the reason why we've been able to expand into five counties actually we're going to expand our ecosystem is because of the um, 12 years of longitudinal data we have collected many of it on on um, science technology engineering and mathematics through the hard repair and different different um, uh, sources of uh, data collection uh, then the in-kind donations which I met before um, in rural areas we've already had those relations it's really interesting in rural areas through our community grassroots movement, we've, we've had a lot of those relationships developed before the ecosystem or during the development of the after school, out of school program. Um, and so when you look at the in-kind donations, it's incredible what people are doing, but that's just second nature to the, um, the, the rural areas. And um, again, for us to, it's big time for us to um, actually have a coordinator. Everything at this point has been all volunteer. And when you look at um, the outcomes of our program uh, through the ecosystem, it's incredible when you think about that, uh, the dedication, the buy-in to the mission. Um, and I really believe the buy-in to the mission reflects the funding we've been able to get. And now that we're going to be able to actually have a coordinator um, with different investments from our partners, and it doesn't it doesn't sound you know it's not a, it's not like as fancy as as a large organization um, which institutions we have those resources, but um, the strengths of of our ecosystem are those partnerships which we're going to talk about next. And it's interesting the partnerships, the data equals an investment in our ecosystem in our rural area. Thank you so much, Jeannie. And actually, I wonder, I mean, that's a really great point in terms of building relationships um, and being able to, to communicate regularly about your work. Um, so perhaps we do transition. I know we have a couple questions and we'll get to those in just a second. We'd also really love to hear from all of the, the folks on the line if there are other um, creative ways that your ecosystem is fundraising as well. Um, but maybe we'll stay with you, Jeannie, and then move the opposite direction. So Jeannie, then Allison, then Heather, if you could talk a little about the importance of, um, you know, cultivating relationships with potential funders or donors, um, whatever that looks like for you, and how you're able to maintain those over time. Yeah, we're going to have a unique circumstance where when we built when we built the, um, when we need, saw, it was a community sector and we saw their needs. So we prioritized and our after school and career was a big topic. So when we built that, that system, that the after school program, which involved the careers and the STEM, 
we never knew that we were going to be building the infrastructure. And in these rural areas, our infrastructure are, our, again, our intermediate units, our schools, our current technical schools, um, our higher education, our community colleges. And it, I think the buy-in and the relation way we were called to vote is through success. And again, um, communicating and the relationships our policymakers, I have to be honest with you, we, our policymakers in our rural areas are big time important to us, our senators, our champions to help us to convey our mission of the ecosystem and the programs we're doing. Um, I think it's our, our success is documented at that return on investment. Whenever you have any programs and you're collecting the success, I think that is a motivator. Data and your success motivates your partners, it cultivates partnerships, and it keeps everybody working on the same page. I know that sounds very simple, but that's the way it seems how it works in our rural areas. So you maintain your relationships um, by having strong return on investment. And, and in turn, it motivates, and I believe in success, um, success builds on success. Uh, yeah, and this is Allison. I would totally agree with that. And um, uh, for our ecosystem, one of our um, uh, uh, efforts is uh, putting on a science festival every year. And uh, for us, the Science Fiesta is like a high value event that attracts funding beyond uh, the big ecosystem partners. Um, and so the ecosystem is able to leverage this event to attract um, other funding and, and, and promote the ecosystem, um, as well as do the work of the ecosystem. That is uh, not only just uh, celebrating science, but uh, communicating about uh, uh, career pathways, uh, addressing math, um, talk, you know, help uh, supporting families in, um, uh, you know, fostering STEM identities in the, within the family. Um, uh, Explora, um, you know, has been around for a while and we've got um, uh, some standing in the community um, and so as a backbone organization, we're able to sort of leverage our reputation and, and our partnerships um, uh, uh, for the for funding for the ecosystem. Um, uh, and we keep these partnerships um, active whether the funding is, a, it is attached or not, you know, so we're um, constantly um, um, sort of seeing where partnerships uh, can be supported, where collaborations uh, can be supported, um, uh, where the uh, where the energy is, um, where the interest is, and and uh, um, but not in a really um, uh, you know trying to do it in a strategic way, uh, trying to do it in a way that makes sense, uh, uh, you know, according to um, our. Um, our uh, you know overall mission and values uh, that that we set from the beginning. That was great, Allison. This is Heather. Um, I, <laughs> you know, Jeannie and Allison had a lot of really good things to say. So um, what I could add is that we build the relationship long before the ask, and. Um, it's always important to align whatever we propose with the funder's mission. And um, and then once funded, don't we don't have to wait until the final report. I like to send them bright spot briefs and information and you know, when Allison's talking about the energy, you know, keep them interested and, and excited about what's going on. Include them in your press releases or if you're on the radio or television, you know, always plug your sponsor. Um, they like to see us cooperate with others in the community and collaborate instead of uh, competing. So this idea of the enlightened self-interest is spreading amongst our funders. It's, you know, an idea that uh, we've been cultivating for a couple of years now, and it's, it's finally starting to pay off. And also, you know, uh, keeping promises. So... We had um, a big problem in our organization in which uh, we were actually closed for several months, but we still had an open grant with open grants with a couple of funders. And even though we were closed to, to the public, our building, these grants were outreach grants, and so we kept them going. We finished these, you know, we finished the project, 
and I wrote the final report with bar graphs and everything, you know, evaluation and gave it to the funder. And so then when it came time to apply to the same funder, uh, but a different organization managing our center, they remembered us. They remembered what our, you know, what our mission is, what we do. They remembered me personally as the grant writer who kept my promise that, yes, we're going to do this. Here are the metrics. We did the last project. We didn't just blow it off. Okay, that's great. <laughs> Those are such excellent points. Um, really great sound bites. Uh, and so we hope to be able to bullet out some of these tips that all of you are mentioning um, here on this webinar. We thank you again for your time. Uh, I think I'm going to unmute one of our, our attendees. Pavi, if you'd like to introduce yourself and your ecosystem and then feel free to ask your question. Sure. Um, this is Pavi from South Jersey STEM Innovation Partnership Network. Um, this question is for um, everyone on the call. Um, some of you said that you had actually a local found you have been working with uh, securing funding with the local foundations. So my question is, how did you discover the local foundations, and what what helped you uh, to build a relationship with them? Uh, this is Heather. I can jump in if you want. Um, I've worked for five, for five years, Pavi. Good to hear from you. Um, and so a lot of these relationships were already in place with my former administration. Um, you know, in Shreveport, there are, a, you know, a handful of foundations, maybe not as many in other places. Um, but uh, not as many corporate sponsorships as you might find elsewhere. Um, and so, you know, a lot of those relationships were already there. And my job was to continue to forge and cultivate that relationship, even through the hard times. Um, and, and, you know, it's interesting you asked that question because I was gonna save this for the end about failures, one of the hardest things for us is when we do approach a funder for the first time. Um, I actually got lucky with one funder. I, every now and then, you know, I get a funder that I've never submitted to. They like what I have to say and they fund me. But um, more often than not, you, if you just go to Grant Station, you know, and you find an opportunity and you submit to somebody, you have no clue who they are and they don't know you. It's kind of hard the first time around. And uh, uh, this is Allison, and, and that's an interesting question for us as well, because um, we are both Explora, the institution that also needs funding, as well as the backbone of this ecosystem that needs funding. And so um, as, uh, New Mexico is, um, you know, we, we've got some of the big labs. Uh, we've got Sandia uh, National Laboratories. Uh, we've got the Los Alamos National Laboratories. Uh, we've got some of the big uh, higher education institutions. Um, foundations aren't as big in New Mexico and everybody fights for that funding. And so we tend to uh, approach them wearing the Explora hat rather than the ecosystem hat. Um, this is Jeannie. Um, again, I think this, the thing was patience and uh, with the foundation and um, don't be afraid to, to on a regular basis, just provide information uh, to the people, to the foundation. Uh, we have smaller foundations in our rural area, but those little pockets of money really um, can make a difference for projects and also um, for your ecosystem. And it was interesting. We, again, I'll go back, we referred for into our after school program, which began and had such great results. And then when we kind of connected an infrastructure into a larger mission of the ecosystem, uh, we actually had uh, AT&T and um, a gas company say, we'd like to support this. Uh, and what they wanted to support was actually the maker spaces. So they kind of came, they, they knew of the after school program and then they saw we were moving to a larger 
a larger pro a larger um, movement, so to speak, and they wanted to be a part of it. They wanted to be a part of the success. So developing relationships, providing the information that you do and your successes, I, I would say don't get frustrated. Continue because you never know when they will come on board and say, we want to be a part of this. Thank you. Um, this is Alyssa again. Sorry for the for the little bit of lengthy pause there. Um, so let's say um, I'm a new ecosystem, and I'm trend, and there are a few on the phone today, um, and I really need to get some operational funds in the door right away. I'm in a, a medium sized community. It's a little, nice mix of urban and rural. Um, there are foundations, there are corporations, um, there are, you know, we have our ecosystem formed. What do I do? Um, based on what's been successful for each of you, can each of you give me one quick piece of advice? Um, do you want to let Jeannie go first and we'll go backwards? <laughs> okay, um, well, when I looked at the idea of lessons learned or getting advice, I would say, you know, um, people want to know what you can do for them. And in our case, a lot of times with our, with our institutions, with most of our education is, what can we do to help our students? So I would look for ways to reach out to show what their investment will do for their institution, their students. Um, and I think it's really important. In fact, we're in the process of we're always doing this. What is it that people are going to look in, look at the, the CSL ecosystem and why you want to invest in it? Um, the other thing is, so, so um, how can it help them? And number two would be, you have to show that you've accomplished something. That's my simple advice right now. Mm -hmm. Heather, are you next? Um, I could go next, sure. Well, um, well, it's really hard to just get an overhead grant, especially as a new ecosystem. Um, I did not have you know, when my um, development director said, well, how are you going to pitch that? Who's going to fund that? You know, what's your what's your pitch? Well, it's been easier ever since the White House, uh, you know, strategic plan has been um, released. And so what I, I, I bring that narrative into the picture. Um, and I say, you know, this is an urgent call to action. And we are here to address that urgent call to action. And this is how we're going to do it. The other thing that I do is that um, I usually pitch a project and overhead together. And the most recent grant was 50-50 uh, project and overhead. And, and when I say overhead, I'm talking about things like paying for Wi-Fi, mobile Wi-Fi hotspots, web, you know, the web design, a graphic designer, um, collateral material like like signs banners or, or whatever you need when you're going out in the community and you need to get your name out there marketing is so important now people need to know who you are well i was able to get that as well as some of my own staff time figured into the grant and believe it or not they funded the whole grant even though and the other half of it was a computer science magnet program at huntington high school so i mean like two very different things and I have some verbiage that I can share with everybody that um, when they ask what if we can't fund your entire ask would you be willing to you know do the project can you do the project for less and I explained what we could do with less nice uh, and I think that the only thing I would uh, sort of add to that is just the 
um, how useful it is as an ecosystem, as a brand new ecosystem, to come around, to come together around, um, like writing a grant brings you together uh, with clear goals and objectives and a way, you know, means to evaluate. Um, it clearly defines um, uh, who the partners are and, and what it is they'll be doing. Um, and it's just a super helpful um, process uh, that, that can bring an ecosystem together around a common, uh, common cause uh, that will have an impact on the community, a measurable impact on the community. Um, so, um, yeah, I think that a, a, a grant, uh, you know, a, um, uh, coming together around a proposal uh, would be uh, one useful thing for an eco a new ecosystem to do. This is Jeannie, real quick, one more, one more thing. I, I, I agree with the two other panelists about the grant, the cause, um, and, and it is very difficult to get overhead. And I don't, and I don't, it was very hard for us. Um, we had to kind of, uh, prove ourselves a little bit, get out there, um, show who we are, and, and we didn't get it through a grant. We're getting it through partners, again, who are saying, I'll put this in, I'll put this in. Tiny little pieces of money that are going to provide us um, for a person. And in, in all honesty, um, we really couldn't do overhead. We've been able to um, do everything, uh, materials, time through in kind and you know sometimes it's better to depend a little bit on that in kind at first because it really builds a strong base and when you have a strong base things will last so um don't get discouraged i, I would work through your strengths of your ecosystem and eventually um that um the, the administration or whatever that sort of thing um will um will come will help come to you but it is not easy you just have to kind of work through it and eventually it'll come in some way shape or form it seems depending on you know the strengths of your community i hope that makes sense yeah that was really great thank you for those final thoughts um i think we probably have time for one more question um and so i'm, I'm going to maybe wrap them together um a lot of you in that conversation talked a lot about the importance of communication. So communicating with your funders and the community um, to build relationships, communicating um, obviously to, you know, communicate what your value add is. I'm wondering if we can, you know, sort of wrap up the power, if each of you could mention, and maybe we'll go in reverse order this time, um, you know, both either successes and failures holistically um, and thinking about fundraising and if there were opportunities for you to weave in that communication narrative in there as well that would be great um, but perhaps we we think and we end today on on successes and failures um, thinking about fundraising and perhaps communication so Allison I think we're starting with you this time and then going oh great first. okay um so yeah in terms of fundraising having the right people um be part of like that 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 a working group is uh can be super helpful because they are good at building relationships they're good at communicating um you know about the uh the 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 role of the ecosystem in 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 community impact and and um and uh you know what what the what what it is that they'll get you know what's the what's the what's the return on investment um uh so i w i would say that um that having the it, it's about relationships and so having the right people uh, uh build those relationships is is super important um understanding and aligning with what uh, the funding agency um wants and needs is also really important um, and that's, uh, uh, you know, initially how we structured our 12 months of math program to do exactly that, um, which worked for a while and then it didn't. And uh, so, um, um, you know, our industry partners at first were like totally enamored with the idea that we're going to do you know, math around aerospace. Um, and now it's like, uh, well, where's the computer science and, and so on. So, you know, just uh, being able to um, um, uh, uh, 
you know, if if your ecosystem is is it depends on what your the role of your ecosystem is. Um, you know, for um, uh, Tini uh, having the role of the ecosystem be to provide after school services, that's going to to remain the same. Um, our ecosystem is a little bit um, structured a little bit differently, and so we are finding ourselves in the position of having to be super adaptive and responsive. Uh, which requires really um, uh, successful communication. Okay, this is Heather. I'm going to keep it real quick. Um, it's good to have a couple cheerleaders or cheer, a key influencers um, that that are either on your team or are in the community, see what you're doing, and share out to the rest of the community, number one. Number two, I forgot to mention that you need to have a website that's a .org, um, preferably, because funders look at that, and they even say so when they have a pre-grant writing funders, you know, meeting with you. Um, our funder said, we look at your website. Well, I struggled through creating the website for the North Louisiana STEM Alliance. It's not perfect. It doesn't have to be perfect because I'm asking for funding to help make it better. <laughs> so that's what I have to add. Um, as I mentioned before, communication is key um, with your funders and the relationship you, you have. In our case, it's the business education, the families, and the policymakers, and that that buy into a mission, to the mission. I think we have something called an action group, as ladies talked about, and our action group is a bunch of leaders, and uh, they're out in the public, uh, very visible, very verbal. Um, and um, they are, are pushing for funding uh, for the ecosystem. And I think it gets kind of confusing, two things. We look at, we want to fund our ecosystem, but we also want to fund the programs. The pro and so that's where the chicken or the egg, because the programs are the ecosystem, the ecosystem is the program. So you have to kind of balance those. But I still think um, in looking for funding, you have to identify with something, something that you do that um, makes a difference in your community and, and your community. And so um, action groups out there in the community, um, programs that have um, outcomes that are positive for the community to put out there. And um, that would be my advice when it comes to fundraising and also um, communication. Wonderful. Well, thank you all so very much. Um, we want to be respectful of your time and everybody's time on the line. Um, again, this is sort of the end and conclusion of this series, but based on the positive feedback that we've been getting, we hope to continue these conversations throughout the year, um, perhaps a little bit more sporadically scheduled so that folks can join them. Um, thank you all. To, our, to all of our panelists for your great contributions. Thank you to all of the attendees for your comments, your thoughts and your questions. Um, and we look forward to chatting sometime soon. So thank you again and have a great summer. Thanks, thanks so much. Bye. Thank you. Thanks all. Bye. -bye.